Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, welcome all of you and all of you on Zoom uh, to this RA7 seminar, which be, we'll, <laughs> it will be the last RA7, uh, RA7 seminar because we are uh, changing the structure of the Bolin from 2022. And we are very happy to have Professor Roland Johnson here from the University. So glad Thank that you. you could come to take the train and come here to, to Stockholm. Uh, and uh, you will talk about ecological rehabilitation of river ecosystems in a future climate. And that is uh, sort of the core of what you're doing uh, at the moment at the new university, where you try to understand the mechanisms behind biodiversity in different geographical contexts, and also uh, how that can be uh, affected by climate, both historical climate and, and the current climate. And you work specifically in water systems. So that is why we are so glad that you could be here because you, you were here also the, the hour before and you see that our research theme is very much linked to both terrestrial and water uh, questions and, and uh, parameters and how you can, uh, how that is affected by climate. So we are very happy that you're here. Thank you. Please, the floor is yours. Yeah, and I... Uh... Uh, I hope you can hear me here and also that you can hear me on, on Zoom. And I, I don't know what happens if I move around, if, if I move out of the Zoom, Zoom camera. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, ecological rehabilitation, ecological restoration in, in a broad sense, and uh, uh, sort of focus on how you can think about uh, ecological restoration uh, in an area of climate change, and then I will use our work on uh, on uh, yeah, northern river, river systems. Uh, so uh, all, all the work is, is focused on northern Sweden as, as sort of a model system, but I hope that some of the ideas are also applicable to other types of ecosystems. Uh, as a, a little bit of an outline, so I thought I would uh, start with saying something about how climate change will, will affect uh, riverine e ecosystems uh, in general, and then talk about how ecological restorations potentially can be used to mitigate and adapt ecosystems uh, to, to uh, uh, a future or a new climate, and then uh, use a few um, model systems. I will talk a little bit about streams channelized uh, for timber floating and how they have been restored. And a big chunk is on regulated rivers, so rivers regulated for hydropower production and uh, how those can be rehabilitated and, and sort of the challenges we see with climate change in, in that work. So, so that is sort of the, the, the bulk of, of my research product uh, at, the, at the moment. And, and uh, towards the end, I hope to talk a little bit about how you can set targets and identify reference conditions uh, when thinking about, well, in, in restoration projects when uh, incorporating climate change into that. Uh, so a little bit about uh, climate change then. So, so uh, I guess this is, uh, this is nothing new, but we expect uh, in northern Sweden then, that runoff in, uh, into river systems will be higher, although it will be drier or, or lower runoff in, in the southeast. Uh, but uh, my work is, is in northern Sweden, where we expect quite considerable increases in, in runoff uh, in the future. Uh, and we will also expect that uh, uh, discharge in rivers uh, 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 will change so that we have lower spring floods and and higher winter discharge. So, so this is a, a bit of a complex figure, but but you can look at uh, compare the uh, uh, the blue lines with the red lines, where the blue lines are sort of the, the mean for for present conditions with a, with a uh, peak uh, runoff period here in, in association with snow melt. Uh, and what we expect for uh, uh, for for future climate. Uh, so, so here uh, the spring flood uh, will come earlier, but be, will be of similar similar magnitude. Where compared to when you go uh, to the south, the spring flood will also be lower in magnitude uh, in the future, and then we will have higher flows uh, during winter. Uh, 
uh, with less snow and more precipitation falling as, as rain. Uh, and we also exp expect changes in extreme events, but, but, but uh, I will not talk very much about that. But in association with a warming climate and changing flows, we also expect uh, changes in the range li uh, limits of species. So then in general, there will be shifting upwards and polewards, uh, upwards in elevation. So one example here being the Arctic char uh, reading. Uh, so this is work from, from uh, uh, other people at Umeå University, uh, where they are modeled presence of Arctic char uh, uh, present or near, uh, near present compared to with what is expected 100 years uh, into the future, where uh, competition from uh, pike and, and trout is expected uh, to lead to uh, uh, Arctic shark dis disappearing from many lakes at lower uh, elevations. And we also have to consider uh, effects of uh, uh, or spread of exotic species. So I just picked one uh, plant species, Nymphoides peltata sjögull, that is uh, currently spreading in, in, in Swedish lakes, perhaps more of a, a south, uh, not so much up in our systems, but, but in southern Sweden. Uh, so some of these species are already pre-adapted or adapted to the climate we are expecting in the future. So they, they might uh, uh, benefit from, from climate change at the expense of, of native species. Um, and zooming in then on, on, on systems I work with, uh, so, so uh, sort of the, the core of my work is, is uh, 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 river banks or, or, or uh, with riparian or shoreline vegetation on, on, along river banks. And, and in uh, large rivers in northern Sweden, uh, the vegetation is usually uh, distinctly zonated. So, so you have upland vegetation and aquatic vegetation, but then you have uh, zonation of vegetation according to uh, inundation toleration of different species. So if you plot different species, you, you can uh, plot nice Gaussian curves where they have their optimum and that uh, uh, specific elevation and then uh, too long or too short uh, inundation periods means that they are, are less abundant. Uh, but you can also see in, in these belts, you have a riparian forest uh, that is flooded during spring floods, uh, followed by willow shrubs that are uh, flooded for between one and two months per year, perhaps. And then uh, graminoids, primarily sedges of, of different species that are flooded, say, between two and three months per year. And then amphibious vegetation. Uh, so having an understanding of, uh, or just assuming that this correlation between undertaking time and, and presence absence of species uh, uh, will hold also in a future climate. We can use this sort of to model what will happen with uh, riparian meditation. Uh, so we have done this for, for the Vindel River, and this is what we uh, expect sort of uh, earlier, uh, spring floods of slightly lower magnitude. Uh, so this is compared to a normal period of 1961 to 1990. And, and I mean, we have already seen big changes compared to that period, almost like a regime shift actually during my PhD student uh, period. So now, now the spring flood is almost a month earlier than it was when I started working with these uh, systems. So then it used to be close to midsummer, and now it's like mid-May. Where you have the peak, snow melt, snow melt peak, uh, and then uh, higher, higher discharge during uh, winter periods uh, expected in the future. So, assuming that the uh, relationship to inundation will be the same in the future, we we can um, sort of uh, plot. Uh, or make projections of how wide these different vegetation belts will be. So this is for present conditions uh, for yeah, different vegetation belts. And these are different uh, climate scenarios. Uh, uh, so two different uh, climate scenarios and then uh, slightly different depending on if we use the uh, entire hydrological year, or if we focus specifically on the growing season, what's going on during the growing season, uh, 
and the idea behind that is that uh, plants are inactive uh, during winter time. So that makes a difference for uh, amphibious, for uh, how high amphibious vegetation will creep. But you can see sort of that the prediction is that sort of upland vegetation will uh, move downwards and uh, uh, amphibious amphibious aquatic vegetation will move upwards so that the, the width of the riparian zone will shrink uh, and the uh, vegetation belts will be more narrow uh, in the future. So we expect that to lead to also uh, uh, lower species richness of, of plants in the riparian zone. So here I've, I've plotted the elevational extent of different uh, plant species. Uh, so this is the elevation extent. These are different riparian species, upland species uh, sneaking down into the riparian zone. And, uh, here are a few amphibious species. And uh, this is the elevation extent. Uh, and then this is how much we predict the elevation extent will shrink or increase. So all the species that are uh, to the left here are expected to decrease in uh, elevation extent in the future. And you can see that sort of the, the maximum uh, change will actually occur uh, not in the gray area where, where flooding time is, is expected to be reduced the most, but, but sort of immediately below where you have a very sharp transition uh, in uh, flooding time. Uh, so, so this this part will be more narrow, so, so species growing here, sort of in the upper willow shrub, so will decrease the most in abundance. Uh, on average, all species will uh, lose between 10 and 30 percent in elevation extent, depending on, on scenario and, and, and which part of the, the, the year you are using. Uh, so most species will be uh, Less abundant, have less air, habitat area, largest losses in the willow shrub zone. And uh, uh, yeah, if this happens, you can also expect that there will be negative effects on, on, on sort of community species richness and, and the ecosystem functions that uh, the riparian zone may have. So, for example, older Almus incana is one of the species that we expect to decrease the most. Uh, so, an important uh, species ecologically providing leaf litter to aquatic uh, insect communities. Uh, so I will be talking intermixed about ecological restoration and uh, ecological rehabilitation. And uh, I show this restorative con continuum from uh, the Society for Ecological Restoration, where they sort of count everything, basically, all uh, where you reduce the impacts over to full recovery of native ecosystems. Uh, and I will sort of make a difference between ecological restorations where you aim for full recovery of, of native ecosystems compared to ecological rehabilitation where you have set the bar lower so that you are aiming for uh, some native recovery or partial recovery of, of native ecosystems. Uh, uh, but I, I'm not very specific. I, I sometimes talk about ecological restoration and, and, and mean sort of anything to the right hip from here. Uh, so you can call me out on that. Uh, so, so some of the challenges then for, for ecological restoration uh, or rehabilitation then uh, when we are entering a, a future climate. So these are different uh, riverine restoration methods uh, going from uh, tearing down dams, uh, dam removal to uh, placing out boulders to, to make uh, uh, riparian zones and aquatic habitats more similar to natural conditions. Uh, so some, some challenges then. then. First, when you need to avoid using irrelevant methods, method that try to restore something that will not be present in the future, obviously. But uh, it's often said, or, or the hope is that you can help mitigate against climate change effects, so, so that, that uh, uh, yeah, with restoration, you, you can reduce uh, the, the impacts of climate change and also perhaps contribute to adapt the ecosystems to the new climatic uh, conditions. Uh, 
in so doing, uh, you should also adjust restoration measures so that they uh, you, so you take into account that you have sort of ever-changing situations so that uh, you have non-stationary -station, station conditions. Uh, and also there might be additional problems with setting targets and evaluate whether the restoration projects have been uh, successful if, 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 your, uh, if communities are, are continuously changing for, for climatic reasons. Uh, and uh, this slide is basically uh, sort of a summary of a report we did for uh, the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency on, on how to use ecological restoration in, in uh, freshwater ecosystems and, and so some ba very basic conclusions. Uh, and one thing that you can, so this is mostly based on, on, on literature, uh, common understanding from, from uh, freshwater scientists. So, so one is that you can increase the re resilience and resistance of ecosystems uh, uh, by reinstating or reintroducing natural processes. Uh, so that is what you should aim for. So that in, in reverie systems could be uh, uh, reintroducing seasonal variation in flow that in turn can uh, lead to uh, uh, to more natural sediment dy dynamics so that you have uh, uh, erosion and sedimentary processes in meandering rivers, uh, for example. Uh, and in so doing, you can mitigate against uh, effects of climate change, like uh, temperature increase, providing refugia, etc. Uh, you can uh, uh, make the system more resilient to extreme events, both uh, high floods and droughts. Uh, and benefit native species over uh, exotic species if you have uh, yeah, provide more of the uh, original or, uh, or pristine habitats uh, that they are adapted to. Uh, but uh, at the same time, you need to remember that, that uh, river ecosystems or, or, or uh, streams and rivers are are very sensitive to change, so they will adapt to to changes in uh, hydrology, hydrology, for example, and, sort of, and, and find new equi equilibrium. So you cannot just go about uh, uh, reintroducing historical conditions, but uh, you will need to take this uh, yeah, change into account. So that is, uh, so at a very basic level, you could sort of say to practitioners, just try to uh, just fix uh, the systems so that you enhance natural processes and we will be fine. But, but it's perhaps a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, first uh, example from uh, uh, how you can mitigate effects of climate change or, or, or how climate change effects can be mitigated perhaps wasn't the, the, the main target of restoration. So uh, we have been working with restoration of uh, streams channel channelized to facilitate the timber flow. Uh, so this is something that was done in all all streams and rivers, uh, small down to some so small that you could just uh, take one step of them. They were used for timber floating also in all the Sweden and uh, much of of uh, South Sweden also actually. So this is a, a reach that has been channelized for uh, timber floating. You remove all the boulders, uh, cut off side channels, uh, uh, remove logs, etc., that could stop uh, uh, the transportation of logs. And these are two different uh, types of uh, restored reaches. Uh, in this specific study, we, we differentiated between basic restoration where you just you go out with your excavator and, and put back the, the, the boulders and other sediment from rock iron stones back into the, to the channel to make the, the channel more complex, more similar to pre-channelized conditions. But we also had uh, the treatment where you uh, sort out the large boulders that might have been blasted uh, during channelization and uh, pulled up the uh, trees and, and Throw them into the channel to make them even more natural. So the idea is that uh, 
This would lead to increased water retention along reaches. Water will flow more slowly, so lower flow velocity. That would increase the duration of, of uh, uh, the inundation in the dry parent zone, and, and uh, that would enhance conditions for uh, riparian plants, so that we predicted or expected the establishment of riparian plants uh, along these reaches. And uh, this is just in inundation duration uh, at different uh, levels in the riparian zone uh, with a different uh, treatment. So at least in the enhanced restored reaches, we, we saw longer periods of inundation duration. So that was what we hoped for. Oops. Uh, and then looking at species richness, you could also see that species richness was higher uh, at uh, sort of mid elevations in riparian zone. Uh, and looking at the reach, so this is for, is for the plot scale. And then for the uh, reach scale, will be sort of constructed uh, cumulative uh, species richness curves. And we could see that. Uh, uh, Species regions accumulated faster, and you had uh, 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 steeper slopes of the species area curves for, for the uh, restored sites and the generalized uh, sites. So, this is uh, to show that species richness has increased uh, at the reach scale at these sites. So, the yeah, we, we could see a longer periods of inundation, increased area of riparian zones with conditions suitable for riparian uh, plant species, so the species richness increased. And this would go uh, uh, against the effects that we expect for uh, with climate change. So, so even though spring floods will decrease in magnitude in the future uh, by uh, uh, increasing inundation duration and, and water retention, we can increase the magnitude of, of, of floods, and that would be beneficial for uh, riparian zones and uh, species richness in riparian zones. So this, you could see that, uh, yeah, at least for the channel, channelized size, by restoring them back to pristine conditions or close to pristine conditions, then we can uh, bring back some of the area uh, for riparian vegetation and uh, at least that goes against the, the, uh, the direction we expect with climate change. Not to say that we uh, will stop the effects. Yeah. But the bulk of our work in recent years has been in, in systems that have uh, been regulated for hydropower conduct, uh, uh, production. And one of the, uh, uh, I'll focus on two types of ecosystems uh, in regulated rivers. First is rapids and waterfalls and, and the ecosystems associated with that. So this is Harsbronget in the Lula River before and after regulation. So this has been laid dry. And uh, in most of these rivers, uh, just a few percent of, of the uh, ecosystems along rapids and waterfalls uh, remain. One percent in the Lula River. Uh, and uh, riparian vegetation, again, uh, we estimate that 12% of the area of riparian vegetation remains in the Ume River because uh, water level uh, variation has been regulated so that uh, either uh, riparian zones are flooded too long, wrong type, long, wrong uh, uh, timing during the year, or you have very intense uh, disturbance uh, from water level variation. And uh, uh, rehabilitation of these types of systems have become a, a big thing uh, recently because of uh, the EU Water Framework Directive uh, primarily. So for that reason, we need to look over and, and re-license hydropower permits uh, uh, permitted in Sweden. So the, our regulated rivers, uh, most of the large rivers in northern Sweden, they were developed during uh, up to the 1960s, uh, 70s with very little uh, environmental consideration. And now to meet the Water Framework Directive, you, they need to be reconsidered and, uh, and uh, 
uh, with environmental uh, considerations. So there's a need for ecological rehabilitation. So this is a work that is sort of underway, but, but it will officially start uh, next year and will continue for a few decades actually in, in, in uh, SS. And the authorities have come up with a strategic plan. So um, it's decided that 1.5 terawatt hours of electricity production can sort of be uh, given away to uh, ecological rehabilitation projects. So that's 2.3% of their annual electricity production in Sweden. That could be lost to environmental improvements. And a, a, a big fund that's been created by the industry uh, with the billions of, or hundreds of millions of Swedish kronor. And uh, as a compensation, they get lower property taxes. Uh, so in, yeah, in essence, it's your tax money that goes into this. Uh, but basically, there will be a work uh, where you go catchment by catchment and evaluate what can be done that is not too costly to improve ecological conditions in these river systems. So uh, uh, the Yungan River here is, is one, perhaps the first one out. Uh, so we are publishing a report actually um, this week, next week, about what can be done uh, in the Yungan River. And, uh, we'll see how that will be received. A few examples of what, what is on the uh, horizon then for, for uh, restoration of these rivers. So one thing, uh, talking about reinstating uh, natural processes, so, would, so it's river systems where you still have high flood events, uh, like in the Klar River, Klar Elven in Värmland, where you have a, a long meandering reach, uh, where uh, uh, sedimentation erosion pro processes are maintained by high spring floods uh, that erodes uh, sediment from uh, outer curves and deposited in the inner curves uh, and creates sandbars where pioneer species like uh, salix, uh, uh, some riparian beetles, uh, Cincidella maritima, a rare species, uh, find habitat. So the idea is to, to enhance uh, this sandbar uh, creation uh, and uh, provide habitat for these pioneer species. And you can see that after, after regulation, the magnitude of spring floods is lower. So what can be done? So we have looked at so we've hindcasted what the riparian vegetation would have looked like before onset of regulation in, in the Claw River. And we, we find that uh, graminoid and willow belt were much, much wider in uh, elevation extent before onset of regulation. Uh, but analyzing the magnitude of, of spring flood is actually, we find that uh, uh, Spring floods with the capacity for uh, reconfiguring the cha channels. So it's estimated that you need something like 500 cubic meters per second. Uh, so, so, so it's here. This red line is just sort of where, uh, where I have flows high enough for, for water levels and, and, uh, and discharge to follow each other. So it's, it's more for technical reasons for me, I put that in. But you can see that during the last 10 year periods, we had at least four or perhaps five uh, spring floods with the capacity to deposit uh, uh, sediments on great sandbars. And actually, during our field work for this project, uh, uh, our loggers were buried under, under a thick uh, cover of, of, of sand. So, this specific logger. Uh, had 66 centimeters of, of sand deposited on, on top of it, but we could find it because we had the exact position anyway. So it seems like even under regulated conditions, there are uh, high flood events frequent enough to, to, to keep this system going. Uh, but we find that the, the main problem here is, is perhaps not the spring floods events, but, but conditions during winter where you have higher than natural uh, uh, discharge and, and on top of that short-term regulation uh, that erodes away these sandbars uh, uh, at an early stage. Uh, 
so it might be more this high winter flows with hydro peaking, meaning sort of rapid water level regulation that, that erodes these bags. Uh, and that's why these types of habitat are disappearing in this river. And this, uh, this might be more tricky to, to fix, actually, uh, because this is so intimately linked to, to electricity production. Uh, so it's not something you can give up uh, easily. So in another product, we are uh, placing out boulders in, in, in near shore areas. Uh, and these are, the idea with this is to reduce ice erosion during winter, especially. So this is something you can do. Uh, so, so this, we have found that this reduces erosion during winter time and leads to sediment deposition and then uh, uh, vegetation establishment. But uh, I think it would be perhaps hard to argue for placing boulders along uh, Natura 2000 areas with uh, meandering uh, rivers. So that would create some very artificial system. Uh, so, um, and with climate change, we also expect uh, uh, that winter flows will be even higher uh, in the future. Uh, so so we, we don't really have a, a viable solution to, to restoring these kind of habitats, uh, I have to say. I'll skip that. And we're also working in, in the in Dal Elven, the Dal River. Uh, and again, we have the story of, of uh, uh, spring floods uh, being higher, high before regulation, reduced to a, a, a fraction of its previous magnitude following uh, regulation. And it's these spring floods that, that uh, uh, maintains the uh, riparian deciduous hardwood forests with uh, uh, oaks and other hardwood species, uh, sort of a, a unique combination uh, uh, for Swedish conditions, uh, at least. So with the loss of, of spring flood peaks, uh, spruce seedlings are invading this uh, shores and, and we, we are at risk of losing this uh, unique uh, type of habitat. So the idea here, uh, so, so we have a project where, where we uh, are analyzing what, what, uh, what kind of flows are needed to uh, maintain riparian vegetation and perhaps uh, specifically keep, keep the spruce out from, uh, from the system. Uh, so this is just a slide showing sort of ideas for, for uh, introducing spring floods uh, into the system. Uh, uh, but then the question is for, for uh, how long do they need to, to uh, uh, be maintained, the sort of high, high flow conditions. Uh, originally they were up to a month long, uh, but uh, we are now sort of trying to model sort of the presence, absence of, of small spruce seedlings. Uh, but small seedlings are more sensitive to flooding than, than uh, large trees. Uh, so our hope is that you could find sort of the cutoff when you can, how many days of flooding you need to kill the spruce seedlings. And, and that would sort of say something about how long these uh, artificial floods would need to be. But you can also, you also need to think about climate change in this context. So in the Dahl River, we expect the magnitude of uh, uh, spring floods to be lower in a future uh, climate. So this is what is expected at the end of the uh, century. So it's not a huge difference um, if we go with, with this more uh, limited climate change option. Uh, uh, but it's also the issue whether, whether that will be discharge uh, to, uh, to provide this water. Uh, so, so there might be issues uh, with actually having enough discharge uh, to sort of waste uh, citation marks uh, on, uh, on a ecological spring flood. Uh, so uh, yeah, we need to know more about the timing, frequency and duration needed uh, of floods to keep 
this, this bruise away and, and uh, uh, its uh, uh, seedlings of oaks and other uh, deciduous tree species, uh, but perhaps also uh, consider what, what, what is the natural conditions in this system in a, in a future climate. Uh, should we do this even if it's not turning back to pristine conditions because we have no other river system in, river system in Sweden that can assume this role? Uh, uh, yeah, this, this is somewhat of an ethical uh, question. Uh, we're also working with um, restoring rapids. Uh, so I showed before that, that most rapids in regulatory river systems have been uh, laid dry. Uh, and uh, one reason is that for them being laid dry is that you have uh, bypassed reaches because water is uh, being led through hydropower stations. So the old river channels is laid dry. Uh, you often call this uh, torfora in Swedish, but it doesn't have to be completely dry or there could be some, some reduced discharge. Uh, so in a project called EcoSpill, so we, are, uh, we have made a database of all these uh, bypassed reaches in Sweden. So there are just below a thousand. Uh, according to our criteria, and they should be at least 30 meters long, for example. Uh, and out of these uh, 800 are uh, completely dry, uh, with no minimum discharge. They are yeah, 300 uh, meters long, median, uh, three uh, quarters of them uh, lack any type of, of uh, mandated minim minimum discharge. And when there is minimum discharge, it's uh, eight, only 8% 8 of the uh, uh, mean annual uh, discharge in, in, during free flowing conditions. So, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is something that is on the table for, for restoration then. And, and I mean, it could have a, uh, a role in ecological rehabilitation in relation to climate change, that uh, these are systems that have become really rare in, in the regulated catchments. Uh, but if you do something about it, you also need to think about how to uh, set the rules for minimum discharge so that they are appropriate for a future climate. Uh, we can see that uh, as long there is as long as there is some minimum discharge, we uh, it doesn't take a lot to have at least some properties of, uh, of uh, uh, lotic ecosystems or, or rapid uh, ecosystems. So this is the proportion of fishes adapted to fast flowing conditions, rheophilic uh, species. So we just a few cubic meters per second uh, in minimum discharge, sort of you, you shift the, the community composition so that it is dominated by uh, rheophilic uh, fish species like trout at the expense of, say, pike and other lake species. And uh, yeah, yeah. reference systems then are dominated by rheophilic species. And you can also see that uh, the more the uh, uh, riparian zones are dominated with, by trees, or you have tree covers along their riparian zone, that is also positive for rheophilic species. Uh, so. Uh, uh, this has basically to do with uh, shading and, and uh, buffering uh, temperature variation. So, so this is a good thing in terms of climate uh, 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 mitigation or adaptation also. Uh, but it's also how this minimum discharge should, should be uh, expediated, so to say. So, so we have already actually uh, Got into the stage where, where uh, uh, the, the longest bypass reach in Sweden in Yukton has been restored. So it used to have, or it does have only 12% of mean annual discharge, and there were lots of ways to raise the water level. Uh, you, you, you can see them as white bands here. So to, to keep the water level up, despite that most of the water has been uh, uh, diverted. Uh, and previously, you had a uh, 
minimum discharge of three cubic meters per second in the winter and five cubic meters in the summer. But from starting this spring, there is a new uh, minimum discharge that is supposed to follow natural uh, uh, runoff in the region. Uh, so it's, it's, it's timed so that when you see uh, snow melt starting in the region, you start to increase the, uh, the discharge in, in, in steps uh, until you reach like a, a, a season high, and then you go down again, uh, and then the uh, winter uh, discharge will be actually lower than it has been uh, up, to, up to now. And the idea is that uh, you will have a spring flood peak and then uh, decreasing uh, water levels and flow during uh, the rest of the year. So that the, this would benefit uh, 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 riparian plants, uh, uh, communities, uh, aquatic communities, both fish species and, and uh, macroinvertebrates. Uh, but this needs to go hand in hand with, with physical restoration of the river. So uh, uh, this is what it looked like before, uh, before restoration. And, and these are these weirs uh, used to keep the, the water level high. Uh, so in association with the, the new uh, flow regime, uh, excavators have been removing these weirs uh, along this reach. Uh, so to basically create two things, you, you, you want the, the uh, 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 flow conditions during low flows, uh, the Thalweg or, or uh, uh, the, the mid uh, of the river with the uh, fastest flows. You want that to be concentrated so to avoid uh, bottom freezing, stranding of fish, etc. Et so, so that you have aquatic uh, conditions even during low flows. And you also want uh, the river to be able to flood during uh, high flow conditions. Uh, so then, uh, yeah, stone walls, et cetera, from the timber floating area have been removed uh, to create room for flooding. And also the weirs have been uh, removed uh, to increase flow velocity. Uh, so to make this river section function more like a natural river with only 12% of the discharge. Uh, you had to roll out the excavators. Uh, so the hope is then that uh, there will be uh, uh, lots of areas uh, or riparian zones that will uh, be colonized by riparian plants, but also that despite that flows will be lower uh, in the winter those will be faster flowing and uh, will be deep enough so that uh, say fish survive, have refugia even during low flow conditions. And uh, I think much more research is needed on this. This is more like we having a rule of thumb on how or design criteria for how we wanted this to work, uh, telling the excavators what to do, uh, but uh, you can see this as an experiment that needs to be evaluated. Uh, zooming out, we have tried to assess the consequences of implementing environmental flows for, for entire regulated river systems, uh, starting with the Ume River. Uh, and uh, this is what a regulated river looks like. So you have uh, reservoirs, uh, where water is stored, and then you have the hydropower stations. Uh, so it's basically bathtubs connected by uh, plumbing, and then the, you can control where, when and where uh, water should flow. Uh, a, a complex system to sort of optimize electricity production. So what we have done is to sort of uh, learn uh, the skills of hydropower engineers, sort of how and, and uh, added on uh, also design criteria, you could say. So uh, uh, knowing how this system is optimized for hydropower production, we could sort of add on our ideas for how to do this in a more ecologically uh, beneficial way uh, with sort of 
extra uh, extra rules. Uh, so these were things that having restrictions against zero flow ev events. Uh, so uh, in regulatory river systems, hydropower stations can stand still for uh, hours, days, weeks at a time when their electricity demand is low. Uh, so completely shut down, no, not a single drop of water passing through them. So the, we think this is not well studied, but we think it's a bad idea for uh, aquatic communities. Uh, so we have uh, uh, sort of put in uh, criteria for always having some minimum flow going through hydropower stations. We have looked at uh, uh, adding minimum discharge to bypass reaches and cutoff side channels, uh, model discharge to fishways. So there's only one fishway in the Wimmer River system today. And also uh, modeled uh, having more natural water level variation in, in some of these uh, uh, runoff river impoundments. So basically these uh, reservoirs in the lower reach of, of, of the river. And then made a large uh, work of inventorying what this would mean uh, in, in terms of, of gains in, in habitat of, of target types of ecosystems. So basically, uh, I call it lotic habitat here, but, but habitat uh, ecosystems along rapids, basically. And then uh, what it would mean in terms of, of uh, riparian vegetation and try to map that for the entire river system. And then uh, calculate what, what these changes uh, would mean in terms of, of hydropower production. So using the same uh, uh, optimizing uh, software that the hydropower industries uh, are using. Yeah. And we can see that, uh, uh, so this is the change in annual hydropower production in the, in the Ume River if this would be implemented. So having restriction against zero flow ends would be a, a 0.5% uh, decrease in production and we can add this on. And, and if we did all of this at all hydropower stations in the entire river system, we would lose some 3.8% of hydropower production. In total. So this is a bit more than uh, the authorities had planned in their uh, uh, in their strategic plan, but I would still say that is quite a low number. Uh, and you can of course uh, decide that we only need uh, two or three fishways and so on to, to further reduce the cost. I skip that. So then the question is how to prioritize uh, them uh, if, if you have this information. So, so our, our idea, sort of this stems from, from a previous project, is that the way to go is to, uh, to calculate the costs in terms of impacts on hydropower production. Uh, so we made those calculations. And then you calculate the potential benefits. And, and we can, you really would want it to be in terms of, of expected increases in, in the population abundance of, of target species. But when uh, uh, we went for a huge simplification, just sort of uh, calculating the area of habitat uh, gain. And then you can sort of do your prioritization so that you get the largest possible area uh, for the cost uh, that you can, uh, uh, that you can afford or, or allocate uh, to uh, rehabilitation measures. So if we extrapolate into the future then, uh, uh, we can uh, adjust the costs using projections of future climate. We, we, we know or we have projections of what future flows will be. Uh, so we've done that. And when it comes to environmental benefits, you would want to adjust sort of the, the projections of, of area created to what you expect in the future. Uh, you could perhaps use uh, climate change projections to, to uh, modify what you expect. We haven't done this, so we have just used our uh, uh, predictions for, for aerial increase with present conditions, but we have done it for, uh, we have sort of put our design criteria into these models with uh, uh, future flow conditions and see what comes out. And uh, Yep. We did it first for, for the Ume River, and we did it together with the hydropower company, Startjaft. 
so this is the change in annual, annual hydropower production compared to present conditions. So with so this is the change in annual hydropower production. Uh, increases upwards, decreases downwards. And uh, yeah, with present regulation, we expect hydropower production to increase in the future because flows will be higher. Uh, and these are projections for uh, yeah, basically when it says 2025 here, it's present climate. And then we have uh, with projections of future flows uh, 2025, 2030, and 2040, uh, so some decade into the future. Uh, and looking at the results, so if we add on restrictions against zero flow events, we will still have an increase in production in the future. We add on discharge to bypass reaches, we would lose, uh, lose hydropower production, but this is with present climate, and this is uh, what we expect in the future. So the cost would go down quite a bit. Uh, and that is true also if you add on discharge of fish waste. And uh, this is sort of the whole lot that we have also natural water level elevation in impoundments. So, so these figures do not match the previous slide because the, this uh, calculation is done in a slightly different way. But, but the important thing is that the uh, the cost for implementing these measures is, is lower in a future climate uh, compared to now. And I guess the, the question is sort of who, who, gets to, uh, who gets to use this extra water we expect with increasing runoff in the future. Yeah. Uh, so what, how to think then about setting goals and targets for restoration and, and identifying res, res, reference conditions in the future climate. So this would be a, a model of, of restoration as it's done now. We have a degraded ecosystem. If you do nothing, degradation might continue with in terms of species composition and biomass or function and structure. And then you try to restore it back to uh, pristine uh, conditions. So that would be your target. If you fail, you might end up with a novel ecosystem with different species compared to what you had originally. Uh, so in, in a future climate, sort of what <laughs> your target for restoration might be a much wider or broader area. You might have to accept that there will be a novel species composition uh, and that there might be novel uh, functions and, and uh, yeah, uh, you might end up somewhere here in this uh, boomerang area and uh, without uh, detailed knowledge it might be difficult to predict where you end up and, and the, it might be difficult to say something about the, the trajectory of, of recovery uh, but, but I think a crucial question to ask then is what, what, what had the ecosystem been like without degradation uh, from the pressure say here hydropower uh, but if you had uh, have, had climate change uh, so, uh, yeah, how to define the process of recovery and how to evaluate that might also be more difficult. So, um, uh, something about how to determine reference conditions in a changing climate. So, so uh, a few questions to ask them. So, if there are pristine reference conditions remaining, how, how you can look at how they have changed or are expected to change. Uh, you might also want or have an understanding of, of, of the ecosystem processes and functions uh, and how they are affected by, by climate. So you can use model, models to uh, recreate or, or, or you can model the reference conditions, what they should be like. Or you can have con knowledge of historical climate change and how ecosystems did respond to that in the past, so like from this pollen record from the UK. Uh, and you can also look at the probability of, of species shifting their geographic range. So yeah, what is the probability that you have new species in the system uh, and uh, probability of exotic and invasive species entering the system. Uh, and also, you also need to think about the, the, the context and a specific site, the landscape context that the, the site is situated in. Uh, so, uh, yeah, 
basically, what we are arguing for uh, in the future is that perhaps you cannot evaluate speed, uh, restoration uh, as a one-off uh, event. So, so previously, maybe you had an ultimate target and you had a development toward that you could uh, reach different milestones. But with climate change, these, this uncertainty uh, in where you are heading will increase with time because of the uh, faster growth, species additions, species losses, enter uh, invasive species, often disturbance regimes. So, so you have increasing uncer uncertainty. So maybe you have to accept that your ultimate target is not a, a specific uh, conditions, but, but, but uh, a, a broader set of conditions. And perhaps you need to reevaluate the, the restoration trajectory uh, several times. And perhaps then you need to uh, make new plans or, plan, uh, or uh, uh, projected trajectories. Uh, new interventions to set off the, the system in the right direction. Uh, otherwise, you might uh, have potential uh, degradation uh, uh, occurring. Sort of taking this the non-stationary conditions uh, in, into account. Uh, I'll, I'll skip, skip this. Uh, and I think this will be especially important in areas where you aim for full restorations, because then you want to come, so as in dam removal, you want to come to close to pristine conditions uh, and, and really want to go towards your, your reference state. So it's all about reintroducing natural processes and you have little impact of other pressures and drivers. Uh, so here you really need to consider uh, effects of climate change. When you do just part rehabilitation, as we are working with in regulated rivers, maybe much of the climate change impacts are of less importance, but uh, these other drivers might be uh, yeah, top of the agenda, so to say. Uh, and you're happy with having uh, any measurable change away from your start starting conditions that needs to enhance biodiversity or ecosystem functions. Yeah, uh, I should really uh, stop, but uh, I think the uh, so conclusion is that sort of my first advice is to reintroduce natural processes whenever that is possible. But that you can, I, I think I've shown examples of where you can mitigate and adapt river in ecosystems to, to future climatic conditions. But you do need novel methods to, to determine reference conditions and targets. And you also need to rethink how you do monitoring and evaluation. Uh, uh, but when we talk about, say, effects of regulation, it may be more important than, than climate change when you design rehabilitation schemes. So uh, we could go on business as usual and think less about, less about climate change. But uh, these issues will be important. Uh, so we are in the... Uh, United Nations decade on ecosystem re restoration and uh, the, the EU also has a plan for restoration until 2030. That means that at least 25,000 kilometers of free flowing river reaches should be restored. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a tall order uh, for us to achieve. Uh, and I should give uh, credit to all my uh, collaborators and uh, people in my research group. Thank you.